Howdy, and welcome back to the Game Vault. With the recent release of the first GTA 6 trailer, and my last episode being on the most recent entry in the series, I thought it would be a good time to take a look back at when the Grand Theft Auto series first jumped into the third dimension, all the way back in 2001. Today, we're looking at Grand Theft Auto 3. Now, disclaimer, I am not playing the atrocious remasters from 2021, but instead the regular base version of the game on PC. However, I will be using a couple of mods to make the game a little bit more functional for modern PCs, which will definitely affect my gameplay experience a little bit, such as a modern control scheme for gamepads. But this isn't a review series, not really, so I can do whatever the hell I want. So if I play the game on, say, an original PS2, maybe certain opinions would change slightly, but you'll have to take what you can get, because this is how I'm playing it, no other way. So, that being said, some real quick backstory, both my own personal and historical. Grand Theft Auto 3 was a game changer. While the original GTA titles had stirred up plenty of controversy themselves, the leap into 3D and the growing presence of gaming in the wider culture put the third numbered entry into the franchise on a whole new level. GTA 3 did for a lot of genres what Mario 64 had done for 3D games as a whole five years prior. It changed everything, and set a new standard for what a game could be. GTA 3 was a fully realized 3D city with people walking around, police cars, taxis, elevated rail networks, subways, bridges, multiple islands, and only a single loading screen between each one. No, it was not the first game of its type, Driver 2 had done a lot of this just a year earlier, but it was the first game of its type to truly capture the public's imagination, and like I said, it set a new standard. That being said, this was 22 years ago, a long ass time in case you're worse at math than I am, and 22 years later, games have changed quite a bit. But everything starts somewhere, and while this isn't the very beginning, it was the beginning of a new era, in the game's own canon and the game's industry as a whole. I started with Grand Theft Auto Vice City back in 2002, when I was very young, and eventually I played all the games in the series, but I didn't play GTA 3 until I finally got the GTA Trilogy box on PlayStation 2, sometime around Christmas of 2005. Vice City was my first, San Andreas was my favorite at the time, and 3 was, well, I mean it was fine. I played through it to the end, but it was always the one that I kind of avoided. I didn't hate it by any means, but I certainly preferred VC and San Andreas. I have since grown to quite love the atmosphere of GTA 3, and we'll get into a bunch of that as we go, but enough of the backstory. Let's just jump right into this game's opening cinematic. So, our story begins with a bank robbery, at a location that can't actually be found in-game. We're introduced to our protagonist and playable character, Claude, as he is shot in the back metaphorically, but face literally, and somehow doesn't sustain any life-threatening wounds, instead surviving and being arrested while his now ex-girlfriend, Catalina, makes off with the money and her new man, Miguel. We then see Claude being transported across the river to some prison apparently, even though there is no prison building on the island they're headed to and while being transported, the convoy is attacked by some Colombian gangsters trying to free somebody else being transported with Claude. Being transfer of felons to Liberty Penitentiary. The attack took place on the Callahan Bridge, leaving few witnesses and the bridge itself severely damaged. Some of the convicts are thought to have perished in the explosion that followed the initial attack. Revelations as to the professionalism of the attack struck police hours afterward, when identification of the missing felons were further hampered by an attack by computer hackers on police headquarters databases. With the Porter Tunnel Project falling behind schedule, this disaster leaves Portland isolated from the rest of the city. Come on! 
Señor Dickhead. It's no problem to kill you. You're gonna be sorry. Ay, ay, get lost. So, thanks to some dumb luck, Claude is now free, along with a friend of his, I guess, 8-Ball, whose hands are messed up from an unexplained incident, which will be retconned years later in the GTA title for the Game Boy Advance. Anyways, the old guy the Colombians were after is freed from the cops and instead kidnapped by the Colombians, and the bridge is destroyed, leaving 8-Ball and Claude stranded in Portland with nothing to their names, or almost nothing. Turns out 8-Ball knows some people and can therefore get Claude some new work, so we've at least got somewhere to start. This is about all the backstory this game gives us, and I mean, I'm even including details that the game hasn't yet supplied us, like our ex-girlfriend's name and 8-Ball's hands being burned. The details here aren't super important, and our playable character Claude is ever silent in all interactions, allowing us to imagine exactly what he might be thinking while you engage in various violent activities around the city. What matters now is we are free. Sort of. We are actually immediately launched into our first two missions, but they're very simple. First, all we gotta do is drive to our safe house in the red light district, where we are first introduced to the saving and car storage mechanics, and then drive around the corner to meet our first real mission contact, Luigi Gattarelli, who also gives us our first real mission in Luigi's Girl. Hey, Paul's got some business upstairs. Well, maybe you could do me a favor. One of my girls needs a ride, so grab a car and pick up Misty from the clinic, then bring her back here. Remember, no one messes with my girls. So keep your hands on the wheel. If you don't mess this up, maybe there'll be more work for you. Now get out of here. Once again though, things are dead simple. The whole mission is just to drive to the hospital, pick up Misty, and drive back. Nothing more to it. And Misty isn't exactly talkative. But I find it highly amusing how far the series has come from back then with what was considered a mission. They will get more complicated though, obviously. For now though, I like to do a lot of free roaming in GTA 3, maybe more so than VC or San Andreas sometimes even. Something about the plot's lack of urgency and the flimsy but still believable motivations for Claude make just being chaotic in Liberty or jumping from exploration one minute to cosplaying as a paramedic the next just work somehow. Speaking of which, immediately after the first two missions I started looking for hidden packages. In the 3D era games, that is GTA VC, San Andreas, LCS, VCS, and this game, there are hidden packages scattered around the map, 100 in total, and they will give you weapons at your safe houses for every 10 that you find, usually. In the later games, these are not nearly as important, but in GTA 3, things like hidden packages and side missions can become critical to completing the game, depending on how familiar you are with old games and how unforgiving they can be. GTA 3 is not the hardest game in the world, but it can be really frustrating. And keep in mind I'm also playing with better controls, such as the ability to drive with R2 and L2 like in modern driving games, or having full control over the camera on foot and in cars, and it will probably still kick my ass. I intended to try and do a deathless run, but that was realistically never going to happen, because this game has a habit of handing you bullshit unavoidable deaths out of nowhere, and trust me, it will. Anyway, after collecting about 10 packages and unlocking the pistol at the safe house, I did one of the game's rampages, which simply asks you to kill a specific number of a certain NPC type with a specific type of weapon in the game in a time period given. I don't think completing these gives you anything other than money and progress towards 100%, but I am not going for 100%, so don't expect me to do all of these or the stunt jumps. After that, I stumbled into doing paramedic missions, which, for anybody who's been a regular viewer of GTA 3 streams, knows are complete bullshit. There are a number of side missions you can do in the game, including vigilante or police work, taxi fares, import-export missions, and of course, paramedic missions. 
All of these either give you money, some new bonus, or both in the case of paramedic missions, which give you an infinite sprint, which can be very helpful, but it's also infamously difficult. You have to complete 12 levels of the ambulance missions without ever once running over a patient, accidentally getting more than one star, or destroying your ambulance since the vehicle's repair system in the game, Pay and Spray, does not allow for emergency vehicles. This all might not sound that bad, but I dare you to give it a try because it is absolutely infuriating. But as if I needed more proof that playing on stream just makes me worse, I actually managed to complete all 12 levels of Paramedic on my very first try this time around, and I have the footage to prove it, which means this playthrough just got a sliver more easy, which for GTA 3 is a very good thing. But then it's on to our next mission in which Luigi's right hand man, Mickey, gives us a note with our actual instructions written on it. Very professional. This time we gotta go beat up some guy down at the docks who has been giving one of Luigi's girls trouble and the game supplies us with our first weapon, a bat, but I mean, I've already got a few weapons of my own. I drive down to the guy, but instead of getting out of my car and tediously beating him within an inch of his life, I just use my car to accomplish the same goal. And then it's simply a matter of stealing his car and bringing it to pan spray, which is also how you lose the cops as I mentioned earlier. Drop it off at Luigi's lockup and that's it. Then it was back into roaming around Portland looking for more hidden packages. Now I'll admit that in the past when I've found all 100 of them, I have used a map online. Completely shamelessly I might add. This time though I wanted to see how many of them I could actually remember where they were, without actually looking up anything, and as it turns out, I remembered quite a few of them, especially on Portland. Speaking of Portland, another side mission you can tackle is vigilante missions, by stealing a cop car or any other police vehicle, or if you're lucky enough, a tank and then getting at least 20 kills on each island, which also unlocks police bribes which spawn at the hideouts alongside the health, adrenaline, and weapons that I've already unlocked there from hidden packages. So then I spent a considerable amount of time trying to get the 20 kills but eventually ran out of SMG ML completely, but luckily for vigilante missions you only need 20 kills cumulatively, not in one single session making it possible to stop, top up on ammo at the hideout, and then get the final 5 kills. On to our next story mission, we have one of our last Luigi missions, which sees us once again driving his girl Misty around town, this time to another member of the crime family Luigi is a part of, the Leone family. Once again, this early on it really is that simple, there's nothing else to be done here, just pick Misty up, drive her to Joey's, mission complete. This is also the first time that we're given a new contact though, and thus a choice on which mission we want to do next. Annoyingly though, many of Joey's missions can only be started between specific hours of the in-game day. Instead of jumping into a Joey mission though, I decided to answer a payphone to take a random job from a random stranger because why the hell not? So this guy, Marty Chonks, wants to have his bank manager killed because he keeps bumping up his loan payments, and Claude is happy to help out. For all of Marty's missions, we have to use one of his cars from inside the bitchin' dog food company yard, yes, that's the name of his company, and go pick up some NPC, in this case his bank manager pick him up and then drive him back to the factory where it is heavily implied that Marty murders him and then turns him into dog food. Lovely. Once the manager is dead, we have to deliver the car to the crusher in Harwood for disposal, but unfortunately, on the way I make a bad turn and... Ugh. Well, this wasn't a death, but it still meant that I lost whatever weapons I had, which wasn't a lot, thankfully. I didn't immediately retry the mission though and instead jumped into something new, but I'll head back later and get it finished to unlock the next Marty mission. So it was then on to see Joey Leone, a new contact, to start his mission thread with the mission Mike Lips Last Lunch, a classic. This mission sees us pulling off a classic mafia hit by first stealing Mike Lips Forelli's car from a parking lot at St. Mark's Bistro and then driving it over to 8-Ball to be fitted with a bomb. Then we just gotta drive it back, park it exactly where it should be and... He's no good. I'm gonna be... Wait, did I do something wrong? It didn't go off. Well, maybe I forgot to activate it or something, but I swear I've done this mission a thousand times. <laughs> well, this is embarrassing. Well, apparently my luck was really starting to run out, so after that I decided to try another new mission with Luigi's mission, Pump Action Pimp. One that I actually knew could be difficult if I wasn't careful. I gotta take out a pimp in the red light district, presumably working for the Diablos, given the car he's in, and while that sounds simple, and it is, the catch is he has a shotgun, hence the title. 
Now, shotguns in GTA 3, in case you didn't know, are super powerful, and can easily one or two shot you with full body armor, even from a good distance. So the key to this mission is to just keep your distance from the actual pimp once he gets out of his car, or just blowing it up before he has a chance to get out. Finally, it's good to hear that music again. Alright, time for an easy one, and a fun one. The fuzzball. There's a policeman's ball being held at an old schoolhouse near the Callahan Bridge. So Luigi wants us to collect as many of his girls from around Portland as we can, and get them over there. They'll make a bundle in his words, and he's probably right. This one is all about speed, but it's really not difficult. You only need to collect four of the eight women you can find, and for each of the ones you get over four, you make an additional $500. It's honestly chump change in this game, but whatever, I like it. If you know Portland as well as I do, this mission is just fun, like I said. Simple, but fun. Nothing bad to say about it. So then I went back and properly completed Mike Lips' last lunch by just walking out of the St. Mark's Bistro loading zone, triggering the cutscene. Ugh. And then it was time to move on to Joey's next mission. So now begins the Leone's War with the Triads, with the mission Farewell Chunky Lee Chung. Side note, uh, Leon? Leone? In GTA 3, several characters say Leone, including the fucking Don himself, but in Liberty City Stories, it's all Leone, and in San Andreas, so I am going to continue saying it like that, anyways. This mission is a straight-up assassination again. We have to take out the eponymous Mr. Chong, who has been dealing the new drug Spank in Leone territory, Chinatown, and therefore, he has to go. We can approach this any way we'd like to, but since I didn't have any grenades on me at the time, which is how I'd usually kill him, I just used my SMG, but you do have to be careful not to get overwhelmed since he has a couple of bodyguards. The next Joey mission is Van Heist, in which we have to, well, steal a van, go figure. There's a security truck driving around, a secure car as GTA 3 calls it, and we have to ram into it enough to get the clearly senile driver to finally pull over and run away. As you ram the truck, you'll get more and more police attention too, which makes things chaotic pretty quickly. I ended up going through two separate cars, a cop car, and a bus before finally doing enough damage. But luckily the truck can't be lost because you get too far away or anything, so you just gotta be good at switching cars quickly, or bring a secure car yourself. Once he finally does get out, it's luckily just a short drive to the docks where I meant to deliver it, where the cops instantly lose interest in it, and we get our first decent payout. 20 Gs. Nice. Time for a change. On each island, there is a phone contact with a string of missions tied to a gang on that island. All of these missions are completely optional, and with the exception of the ones on Staunton Island, also basically irrelevant to the larger story. Just fun extra side missions. On Portland, we get missions from El Burro, who is one of the very few characters to technically be making a return from GTA 2. It was characters like El Burro that initially blurred the lines between the two universes being separate, and I imagine for a while they were basically considered the same, but eventually it would be decided that there are three separate continuities within the GTA universe, which all loosely share some events and characters in common. El Burro is the porn-making and distributing leader of Portland's Diablos gang, and before he's prepared to let us do some real work for him, Claude has to prove himself by winning a race with a car of his choosing. This one is another that's very simple, but plenty fun. I actually like driving on Portland more than the other two islands, and the course for this race is pretty good. The race is easy too, so easy that a cab driver could win it. Tommy Angelo, eat your heart out. No. After that, I went back and completed The Crook for Marty Chonks, putting his bank manager into the car crusher, and then went back to try and start the next Marty mission, but it wasn't available. I'm still not actually sure how exactly you get these missions to trigger. They are also the only ones that I know of that don't have a blue circle when you start them, unlike all the other phone missions. And there's also a fourth mission from him that only becomes available late game, I think, so you would have to come back here long after you'd probably left Portland behind. So instead, I decided to start the next Joey mission and meet another new contact, a capo in the Leone family, Tony Cipriani. Hey, I'm Tony Cipriani. Continuing the beef that we started with the triads, Tony wants us to take him to a Leone front business in Chinatown that hasn't been paying its dues, so he can set them straight with a baseball bat. After we drop him off, he gets ambushed by a bunch of triads, and all we have to do is drive him back to his mother's restaurant in St. Mark's. We can kill the triads here, which I do, but it isn't necessary. Okay, now for a hard one, dead skunk in the trunk. This time, we'll be continuing the beef that we also started for Joey with the Ferrelli brothers, or Ferrelli family. It isn't clear if the Ferrelli family has actually just been reduced to three brothers at this point or what, but we already killed one. Now, Joey has killed another Ferrelli gang member or brother or something, and his body is stuffed in a car at the diner in Callahan Point. 
so we gotta head down there, collect the car, and bring it to the car crusher for disposal. When I get there, though, I'm greeted by two of the Ferelli brothers in their cars, and they try to take me out. Whoa, Jesus, these guys are bold. They can't get me up here, though, can they? Oh, Jesus, yes, they can. Okay, 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 okay. I, I have a plan. Woo! Okay, okay, now one at a time. Oh, God, if they accidentally blow up the car with the body in it, I'll fail. Nope! Oh, I'm going for the hill again. Ah, no! Okay, okay, okay. There, there, he's on fire. I win. Oh, God, why did I jump back that way? Oh, back, 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 back. Whew. Wow. And that's what I call by the seat of your pants. Now, that was definitely the hardest mission so far, but GTA 3 is arguably the hardest of the series, not counting the 2D era, so... It will definitely get a lot harder, trust me. Next, more triad tribulations with the mission taking out the laundry for Tony. We gotta take out several triad laundry vans driving around the city. And the game gives us grenades, since if we were playing without any hidden packages or having done taxi missions for money, we likely wouldn't have any SMG ammo at this point, or at least not much. But I do. So I pretty quickly gave up on trying the grenades and stuck to shoot and run. Once you liberate yourself of the burden of having to flail around with your only 10 grenades to destroy 3 trucks and use guns instead, it becomes a pretty simple mission since there is otherwise little resistance on the streets unless you get more than one star. Then it was time for a break. I spent the next hour doing one of my favorite activities in the original GTA trilogy and stories games, Taxi Missions. For some reason, GTA 3 especially, I think, is my favorite game in the series to do taxi missions in. The car handling isn't particularly great, it's relatively easy to flip over your cab, but something about the vibes of Liberty City 2001 and the perfectly suited soundtrack just make this a ton of fun. I would have done all the way up to 100 fares consecutively if I could have, but I was rudely interrupted by a cop after about 40 and decided to take up my frustration on the officers who arrested me. Or whoever was working the next shift, I guess. I needed to blow off a little more steam though, so next I jumped into another El Burro mission with another classic, I Scream, You Scream. There's a fantastic video that I remember which went into the details of GTA 3's development. I can't remember what the heck it was called, but I'm pretty sure I remember hearing that at one point, this mission was going to be for the cut character Darko, and that the targets were originally children, or the ice cream truck was a school bus, or something messed up like that. I can't remember if there's any truth to that or not, but either way, I can't not think of that whenever I do this mission now. So, what we actually do here is steal an ice cream van and rig it up with a bomb and eight balls. Then we just gotta drive over to Atlantic Key, turn on the jingle jingle, and wait for the mobsters to approach. If you time it right, you should blow up all four with the explosion. Nice, simple fun. Also, rip to the mafia guys looking as cool as possible when walking up to order ice cream like a group of school children. More side content next with another Marty Chonks mission, which was available as I drove by. The thieves this time. Last time we took out his bank manager, but now he wants us to take out a pair of thieves who he hired to break into his apartment to claim on the insurance as you do. Well, they tried to pull their own scam on Marty and demanded more money than initially promised, and now they're on Marty's shit list. So we head over to pick them up, drive them back to the factory, Marty turns them into dog food, and then I just gotta bring the car to the pay and spray and return it to Marty for a mission complete. Now it's time for a Joey mission. Please come back between- Ugh, I despise this mechanic. Guess not. Time for more taxi missions. This time, I completed another 60 for a total of 100, and unlocked the best car in the game, the Borgnine Taxi, a little tribute to Escape from New York. Now, I planned to continue with the Elboro missions, starting the next one, Trial by Fire, the next time that I booted up the game. But, this mission is simply a rampage, killing 25 triads with a flamethrower in Chinatown, and after you do it, all the enemies in Chinatown become a lot more hostile, so about 7 kills in, I abandoned it, and decided to try another mission thread related to the triads, with the intention to come back later and finish it. So it's time for a new mission thread with Tony Cipriani's missions, starting with the pickup. Tony asks us to go and pick up what the triads of Chinatown owe him for collections that week, or month, or whatever. We head over to this alley, which has three separate entrances, and collect the briefcase where several triads will spawn in, and all but one of the alleys will be blocked by triad trucks. The rest is just survive and return, but I ended up having a lot more trouble than usual with this one. I also ended up killing all the triads here, even though I didn't have to, just because I could, and then returned the briefcase to Tony. Then I went on another rampage. I didn't do a rampage mission, I just went haywire and fought the police for a while, which is always one of the most entertaining things you can do in a GTA game. 
When I got bored of that, I returned to Joey for his next mission, The Getaway, which sees us serve as a driver for a bank job. Using the Patriot that I already had, which has great speed and pushing power, I drove the boys right back to their hideout, but apparently didn't take my meds that morning because I completely forgot to hit the pan spray to lose our wanted level on the way there, and so I had to do a 180. Completing it though nets us another 30k though, which is pretty nice, and though I know I've complained about it a lot in some other video, GTA 3 pays significantly higher than pretty much any other game in the 3D era, especially in the early game. Now the downside is that weapons certainly cost a lot more in this game, but you can also make a lot more money faster doing side activities like taxi, vigilante, or paramedic. So I have really never struggled to have buttloads of cash in this game, and it's been a very long time since one of the few missions which asks you to have certain amounts of money stop me from playing and force me to grind. I mean, I do grind, but I like grinding taxis or other side missions in this game more than any other. I don't know why. But now it's finally time to meet the head of this Mafia family Claude's been doing so much work for, Salvatore Leone, played by the late Frank Vincent, and he delivers a fantastic performance even if he only has a relatively minor role in this game. Before we meet him though, we need to first get to him, which means picking up a limo and Joey at his garage, and then collecting Luigi and Tony so we can all head to Salvatore's together. When we pick up Tony though, triads ambush us, forcing us to make a mad dash for the mansion. Luckily, I knew where I was going though, and also knew the best direction to approach the house from, since there are two more triad vans blocking the main road. Sneak past them and slide into the garage for a mission complete, and an iconic cutscene. You did good back there, kid. Real good. Come on, let's introduce you to the Don. Hey, Luigi! Oh, my girls have been missing you so long, Salvatore. You've been away too you long. You tell them once this unfortunate business is taken care of, We'll all go down to the club and celebrate, okay? Here's my boy. How you doing, Pop? You got yourself a good woman yet? Hey, your mother, God bless her soul, would be turning over in her grave to see you without a wife. I know, Pop. I'm working on it. Tony! How's your mama? She's a great woman, you know. Strong. Firenze. She's good. Fine. Terrific. Terrific. Now, listen, you guys, you go inside while I talk to our new friend here. I see nothing but good things for you, my boy. Our first mission for Salvatore introduces us to a much more important character for the larger story of the game, his wife, Maria Latore. While Sal isn't exactly the world's best husband, and Maria herself is quite a handful, so he hands her off to Claude for the night to keep her entertained, and be at her beck and call since he just can't be bothered at the moment. Maria takes to calling Claude Fido, because in case you didn't know, since I don't think I've mentioned it yet, Claude is never actually named in this game, and would only be confirmed to be called that in 2004, with the release of GTA San Andreas taking place nine years prior to this, where he is seen near San Fierro. She asks us to first take her to her drug dealer down at the waterfront, and then after picking up, to a party in Atlantic Key that her dealer tells her about. We drop her off at the party, but I already knew what was coming, the popo. So after about 10 seconds of partying, the LCPD shows up and you need to get Maria back in the car and the hell out of there as fast as possible. Good thing nobody cared about those guards. You don't actually need to hit a pan spray here though, you can just head right back to the mansion and right before you enter the garage, your stars will magically vanish. Next, I went back and actually completed the Elboro mission, Trial by Fire. As I mentioned before, this mission is literally just one of the game's rampages, but in mission form. The rampages, along with things like stunt jumps, challenge vehicles, hidden packages, and side activities, are all remnants of the more arcadey origins of the series, and would slowly be eliminated or modified as the series matured, so to speak. This mission is just go to Chinatown, pick up flamethrower with infinite ammo, kill 25 triads in 2 minutes, that's it. That being said, that's not a bad thing. The rampages are fun, I'm just usually too lazy to go around finding them, and there's not enough of an incentive for me to complete them all, but... Nonetheless, burning things in GTA is always fun, and the GTA 3 flamethrower is especially effective. Speaking of fire, next it's time to turn up the heat on the Leone Triad War with the Tony mission, Triads and Tribulations. This sees us taking three Leone soldiers with us to take out three different Triad Warlords around Portland. This mission really requires a good fast car with good handling, since you're almost guaranteed to lose some tires, so I took my trusty steed, the Borg 9 Taxi, and took out the first guy via drive-by. The second guy is a bit trickier, since he's in an area that requires you to get out of the car. He's in the gated area that Chunky Lee Chung was in. 
Things got a bit dicey here as the cops, triads, and leones were all fighting each other, and we lost one of our boys, but then it was on to the last one over at the triad fish factory. The thing is, to get in the fish factory, you normally need either a garbage truck or one of the triad vans, but I forgot about that, so when I got there, I went in solo, using my car to hop over the fence and take out everybody on my own. Uh, or not. Hey boys, how the hell did you get in? Next, I hopped back into the El Burro missions with his finale, Big and Vainy. Nice. In this mission, we have to follow a thief who stole El Burro's precious donkey porn and collect the porn as it falls out of the back of his car. You don't actually have to collect every single piece, but I'm not exactly sure how many you can miss. The real goal here is to follow the guy all the way to his destination, but the time limit you're given is only extended by collecting more magazines, so if you miss too many and have to correct your path, you very well might run... Ugh at a time. I didn't just let this one sit though, I jumped right back in to give it another try, since I remember that he turned into the docks now. When you do finally reach the guy, you gotta kill him and then return your van, now full of porn mags, to a porn mag shop in the red light district. Now the world finally has its El Burro donkey porn, and that's one more mission thread wrapped up. Now don't be alarmed by what you see on screen, but for some odd reason, next I decided to try a mission while playing entirely using the top-down camera in the game. The most obvious carryover from the top-down 2D era of GTA games that came before this is this camera mode, which exists for both vehicle and on-foot controls. Playing like this is very difficult and certainly its own challenge, but very, very doable. And doing a full top-down playthrough of this game is something I've honestly always wanted to do, but never had the time. However, it takes some serious getting used to, especially combat, which is a whole other ball game, and Neither the Frankenstein control scheme that I'm using or the game's default control scheme really work all that well with this camera. Again, totally doable though. Anyway, I decided to try a mission that can sometimes be hard in third person in top-down mode, cutting the grass. In this mission, we have to track down a bartender working at Luigi's Club who has been ratting on the Leone family, or at least Salvatore suspects that he has. So we have to follow his taxi from Luigi's to wherever he goes, and if he is talking, take him out. Now, one neat little thing about this mission that saves time and is just pretty cool is that you don't actually have to follow his taxi to his destination, which is pretty boring. Instead, you can actually just move his taxi out of the way and drive your own taxi, and he'll just get in your car, allowing you to drive him to the docks yourself. Yeah, so that's where he's going, the docks, and when we bring him there, he meets with both Miguel and Catalina from the beginning of the game. After the cutscene, we are given control again and have to kill him, but I knew Curly had a shotgun and tried to be careful about approaching him. I didn't want to try and ram him, miss, and have him one-shot my car with the shotgun, so I got out of my car and attempted to take him on one-on-one, -on, -one, on foot, in top-down mode. It wasn't a very intelligent decision. Eventually, definitely not, after screwing up the taxi switch like three times and having to retry, I take out Curly in normal third-person mode using the only method that the Borgnine taxi can facilitate. The spikes in the front definitely help. But then it was time to put an end to the Triad War once and for all with the last Tony mission, Blowfish. This mission is quite cinematic, but it is stupid simple if you have a decent handle on driving in GTA 3. We have to blow up the Triad's fish factory, which we infiltrated in the last Tony mission. Like I said in that mission, it will only open its gates for either one of the Triad vans, or in this case, a garbage truck or dust cart as Tony calls it, I'm guessing that's New York slang. So we head over to 8ball who already has a truck rigged and ready to go, and the goal is simply to drive it to the other side of Portland and enter the factory perimeter. The tricky part is that if you crash the truck too much it will explode, but it isn't super sensitive and the time window isn't super tight, so I've never found this part particularly difficult. Reach the factory and they open the gates no problem, so just park the truck in the given spot, activate the bomb, and then watch the fireworks. Also, I can't not hear that one piece of famous Italian music that's in GTA Liberty City stories whenever this explosion happens. And now for our penultimate mission on Portland with Bomb to Base, the only mission to have two individual acts, technically, I think. So while we've mostly been focusing on the Triads and the Forellis so far, the cutscene with Curly Bob made it pretty clear that the Colombians have been the real threat to the Leones all along, being the ones responsible for the Triads getting their hands on Spank in the first place, though the Forelli thing might just be because Joey is crazy. 
So, Salvatore wants us to finally take the fight to the real enemy and blow up the cartel's boat at the Portland docks, where he suspects they must be manufacturing their drug. To accomplish this, first we need to go and see 8-Ball, who will ask us to come up with $100,000 to pay for the explosives ourselves, but uh, Salvatore never mentioned that part. Feels very Mafia 2, eh, hey, sure, you can be in the family, just gotta pay a little entrance fee first, you know, ya mook. But I would never actually thought about that until like now. So after Claude for some reason pays for this bomb, probably out of spite and interested only in getting back at Catalina, we have to drive over with 8-Ball personally to blow the boat up. All we gotta do here is kill all the Colombians on the boat before they can kill 8-Ball, and the game gives us a sniper rifle, so it isn't that hard. Unfortunately, and I can't blame GTA 3 for this, something about my controller mod for this game, which gives me a control scheme otherwise much closer to the definitive editions with accelerate and decelerate on the right and left triggers, makes it so that for the sniper rifle and rocket launcher, I can sometimes become oddly locked in place, or the weapon will simply not fire, which causes a variety of issues for me, and has in every single playthrough I've done of this game in the last several years. Again, this isn't GTA 3's fault, it's the mods, and thus mine, but still, I knew this mission had caused problems for me before, because 8-Ball will start running once you fire your first shot. The problem is, like I said, sometimes firing the sniper just doesn't work. It'll just make the click sound like you're out of ammo, but that apparently counts, and 8-Ball can apparently hear that, since he'll start running up and get himself killed. God damn it. I do eventually get lucky enough, and my controller cooperates long enough for me to use my vantage point on top of this building to snipe all the Colombians on deck. And then 8-Ball can plant the bomb, and we can watch another wonderful early 2000s renderware explosion. After taking down a tanker and dealing a massive blow to Catalina's organization, though, it was time to help another maniac with their misogyny by doing the mission The Wife for Marty Chonks. There isn't much to say. Marty missions are all very simple. This time we pick up his wife from the nail salon, bring her to the factory, Marty turns her into dog food, and the twist is we have to dispose of the car in the water. Now, I hope you didn't come to this game from GTA San Andreas first, because you cannot jump out of your car while it's moving in this game, meaning this objective isn't quite as simple as it sounds. I mean, it is, you can literally just push it into the water with your body, but the game never tells you that, and I'm not even sure if that's how they intend for you to complete the mission. That's always how I do it though, using this dock in Atlantic Key. I'm curious, what do you usually do? Now, finally, it's time to wrap up Portland. Technically, there is one more Marty mission, but like I mentioned before, it's always hard to unlock, or I'm still not clear on what the criteria are for it being playable, so I'll come back to it later, probably. But it could end up being after the game's main story, knowing my memory. We go see Salvatore, and he congratulates us on a job well done with a tanker ship. He says that there's just one last job to take care of, and then everybody can go and celebrate, and presumably Claude would be made, but anybody who'd seen any Mafia movie probably already knew that was bullshit as soon as Sal said it. We are sent to supposedly collect a car near Luigi's with a dead guy's brains covering the back seat, Pulp Fiction style, but if we actually get inside the car, it explodes. Instead, as we approach, we'll get a pager message from Maria, which, look, I know lots of people watching this might not remember what a pager is, but, I mean, I barely do, since they were already on their way out when I was growing up, but this is not how they worked. They were not text messaging devices that just couldn't call, but whatever, it works for what the game wants out of it. So Maria tells us the car is a trap and asks us to meet her at the docks instead, where she reveals that Salvatore put a hit on Claude when she led him to believe that she'd been cheating on him with Claude. Feeling guilty, Maria is willing to help us get to safety with the help of her old friend, Asuka Kassen, so we all hop into a boat and finally unlock the second island, Staunton Island, and enter the second act of the game's story. Side note, I knew that the bridge would fix itself after this mission, but I actually noticed it for the first time myself. The bridge is just destroyed one second, and as soon as you complete the mission, it just magically fixes itself. Guess the construction workers just procrastinated until the last minute and then started doing crack, or, or spank, I guess. But now it's time to fulfill a GTA trope. You do some jobs for a fool, develop a little uneasy relationship, and then they ask you to do something above and beyond. You fall out, fools get capped, and then you start all over again with some other fool. Time to kill Salvatore. This mission is rather open in terms of what can happen depending on how you go about it, but I pretty much always do it the same way, so... 
drive back over to Portland over the now rebuilt Callahan Bridge and drive over to Luigi's, being careful not to actually get too close. And there's a staircase here which leads to a hidden package, but more importantly, an overlook with a perfect view of the entrance to Luigi's. Whenever I do this mission, I just stand up here and wait for Sal to come out, but you can also try and take him out by whatever means you have, with the only goal being to not die and prevent him from getting back to his mansion alive. Now, remember that controller issue I mentioned earlier during the mission bomb to base? Well, like I said, it only affects snipers and rocket launchers, and during my first attempt at this mission, it decided to be a bastard at the worst possible moment. Fuck. 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 But I was too lazy to climb my ass down those stairs, find a car, and chase him. Instead, I just tried it again exactly the same way, and this time the sniper actually cooperated. Nice. So now we have a new island, new contacts, new guns, a new save point, and a whole lot more chaos to cause. At this point, I spent a good while just driving around and exploring. I found a hidden package I knew I couldn't get earlier, out on this rock, which required a boat, and I bring 8-Ball's original Karuma to my apartment slash save point in Newport. I briefly considered getting all the hidden packages on Staunton, as I had done in most of my past playthroughs for infinite ammo, but I decided to skip it this time to give myself a bit more of a challenge, and instead tried to get my hands on a tank by going on a bit of a rampage along the boardwalk in one of Phil Cassidy's trucks. It didn't work. I don't actually think you can even get six stars until you've unlocked the third island, and even then you aren't normally able to obtain a tank without cheesing the game, but that's never stopped me from trying. To get started on Staunton Island though, I didn't do a normal contact mission, but instead jumped right into this island's phone slash gang missions for King Courtney of the Arties. Our first one is Bling Bling Scramble, which, similar to the mission Turismo for El Burro, is a race of sorts. The way it works here though is that we need to drive through the most amount of checkpoints across the map, but there's no set path and checkpoints move as each player drives through them. Really, if you've got a hang of driving and you bring a fast enough car, this one isn't too difficult, but it's another good one that doesn't try to bite off more than it can chew. Having proven himself, Claude's first real job for King Courtney then is Uzi Rider, in which we have to drive with several Yardies over to Hepburn Heights to do a drive-by on some Diablos. Now, the actual mission objective here isn't too difficult, but the catch is, after completing the mission Last Request, or Sayonara Salvatore, large parts of Portland become very hostile, and difficult to navigate thanks to the Leone soldiers carrying the almighty GTA 3 shotgun. Now, when I'd done Sayonara Salvatore, I'd managed to just kind of drive around the more infested Leone sections, but for this mission, I decided to be extra careful for whatever reason, and went all the way around through the Portland docks into this tunnel. This allowed me to go right underneath St. Mark's and avoid all the Leone soldiers, popping out the other end in Harwood, and then just driving over into Hepburn Heights. From there, like I said, it's simple. Just drive by on at least 10 Diablos, and even if you're out of ammo, the Yardies will help take care of them. Then just drive back to their territory in Newport, and we're done. Now for an interesting one, and honestly, writing this script now, it's occurred to me how much more often I enjoy playing the open-ended objectives in these older titles, which, while not completely absent from titles like GTA V, seems like it was often considerably downplayed, especially as the series went on. This is Gang Car Roundup, and just like it says on the tin, King Courtney wants us to collect him three separate gang cars so he can perform a false flag attack on any gang that he'd like to. So, by whatever means we want, we need to acquire a Yakuza Stinger, a Mafia Sentinel, and a Diablo Stallion, and bring them each back to Courtney's lockup in Newport. Now, the downside to these very open-ended objectives is that a new player might have no idea where to find these cars, to be fair though, if you've been paying attention and doing most missions, it really shouldn't be difficult. The player has had opportunity to run into all three of the cars needed during the main mission, so... Now the first and most difficult of these cars is the Mafia Sentinel for reasons I explained in the last mission. What I ended up doing was driving into the Portland docks and from there making my way to Portland Beach to the west of the St. Mark's area, until I reached Salvatore's mansion which isn't guarded by any actual NPC foot soldiers. I knew that there were always at least two Mafia Sentinels there, so it was just a matter of taking the same route back to avoid any shotgunners, and that was one car down, two to go. For the Diablo Stallion, I just used the Porter Tunnel to cut right between Portland and Staunton, which I'm now realizing would have been way easier than my convoluted route during the Mission Uzi Rider. Then, for the Yakuza Stinger, I know there's one that always spawns outside of Asuka's apartment in Newport, which is also practically right around the corner from Courtney's lockup, so that was that. Now, for the only phone-slash-gang mission which ties directly into the story, like I mentioned earlier, and a mission that I have often considered one of the game's hardest. 
especially if you're playing it for the first time blind. Courtney tells Claude to collect a package from a car in Bedford Point and make it quick. That's it. So I rush over there in a cheetah, since the timer is actually pretty damn tight here, and when we get there, we have to get inside the car, where it's implied that Claude finds a note written by none other than Catalina. It turns out the Yardies have an alliance with the cartel, and therefore Catalina, and Courtney was only using Claude to get some dirty work done before handing him over to her. This is an assassination attempt. As Claude finishes reading the note, a bunch of NPCs spawn out of four separate vans. These unique NPCs, dubbed Spanked Up Mad Men, scream creepy lines of dialogue while running at you full speed with bombs strapped to their chests. They will spawn infinitely from the four vans surrounding you, and you have to be very careful to kill them from a distance to not end up getting caught in the daisy chain of explosions, because it only takes one at full health to kill you, and two if you have armor. Now, I have had a lot of trouble with this mission in the past, and I came into this not even having the M4, but amazingly, despite failing other missions during this playthrough that I've otherwise never had a problem with, I actually managed to beat this first try. The key is to immediately kill the four guys that spawn and then target each van aggressively, using the explosions from the madmen to set their own vans on fire. Now once again, despite being directly tied to the story and actually one of the game's more interesting and challenging missions, this was completely optional and easily missable by any player who chose to ignore the phone missions or assumed that after the El Burro ones, they would all be exclusively side content. But now it's time to actually start working for the Yakuza with a mission for Asuka under surveillance. Here, Claude meets Asuka's brother, Kenji, who co-leads the gang with his sister. Asuka tells us that the FBI, which, yes, were actually just the regular FBI back in this era, not the HD Universe's FIB, has set up a surveillance operation monitoring the Yakuza across the city. She wants us to track down all of the FBI's men and put them down, and they're separated into three different groups. First up is a couple guys presumably watching parts of Newport from Belleville Park in the middle of the small island. These guys do have assault rifles, so getting too close is a bit of a bad idea, but I still had plenty of sniper ammo, and after fighting my controls a bit, I took care of them. The second group is two guys in a van in Bedford Point, but they don't put up much of a resistance when I show up, and I can just use a drive-by to set their van on fire. The last group are the most logically placed, but also a bit tricky to find if you're not paying attention. They're all on the balconies overlooking Kenji's Casino in the Torrington District, and they're all armed with sniper rifles. As long as you have one, which I did, you can just snipe back at them, but if you don't come equipped with a sniper, you will literally have to buy one from ammunition, since your only other option, as far as I can tell, would be rockets, and unless you're using cheats, you wouldn't have access to rockets just yet. But with all of them dead, we're already at Kenji's Casino, and I figure I might as well start his mission thread now, since his is one of the ones that can be completely skipped depending on what order you complete the missions in, something later games in the series tried to eliminate. Kenji's first mission is Kanbu Bustout, in which we must break a high-ranking Yakuza gang member out of police custody at the station in Torrington. This involves first stealing a police car, but luckily there's one at the police station we're going to be coming back to. Take that to 8-Ball, who also has a garage on Staunton Island right next to the pay and spray, and then park the cop car right in front of the station doors. Now, for some reason I always hop into the SWAT truck here, but I don't know why I always forget that emergency vehicles can't use the pay and spray. It didn't end well. Well, once again, instead of instantly retrying the mission, I actually tried something new next, with a mission for the other Yakuza leader with Paparazzi Purge. Apparently, some sleazy reporter has been keeping an eye on Asuka and Maria at Asuka's apartment, and she wants us to deal with them. Now, this mission isn't really complicated. The mission explicitly tells you to go to one of the police boats, which has guns, and chase the guy on the water. Me, though, I'm always trying to outsmart the game, but with GTA 3 specifically, it rarely works out in my favor. I thought maybe I could snipe the guy right out of his boat, and I tried it several times, since failing just means turning around to start the mission over again, but it doesn't work. Then, eventually, I gave up and tried to do it the way that the game wants, but went down the wrong set of stairs and jumped into a regular civilian boat, not the police boat, meaning I literally couldn't do anything. Again, this one is all on me, not the game. Eventually, I actually get the police boat and slowly, tediously whittle away at his boat's health until... But that could have and should have been so much easier. Time to be introduced to another new contact, though, with the next Asuka mission, Payday for Ray. Asuka has had an LCPD detective on the Yakuza payroll, and she wants us to deliver payment to him for the last job that he did for them. The guy is understandably paranoid, though, so it isn't as straightforward as just meeting him. Instead, we have to drive to several different payphones around Staunton, where, using an artificial voice, Ray will tell us to go to the next payphone. 
Eventually, at the payphone just outside of City Hall, he tells us to meet him face to face at the public bathroom in the middle of Belleville Park. And that's it for now. But now, we have a new thread open to us. Once again, I was right here, so I just jumped right into Ray's missions with Silence the Sneak. In this mission, we have to take out Ray's old partner, a character who makes a larger appearance in a future prequel game, Liberty City Stories, Leon McCaffrey. Now, Leon is a Leone family inside man, and as I said, Ray's former partner, and recently he turns state's evidence and has begun talking about everybody he ever worked with in exchange for a deal. Well, Ray is one of those people, and now we, for him, have to go and find Leon at his apartment under armed protection and take him out. This mission is tricky because I'm once again not actually sure what the intended method here is supposed to be. You have to throw a grenade through McCaffrey's window, but to do that, you need to be much higher up. At least, I think so. Now that I think about it, I haven't actually tried doing it on foot in a long time, but maybe it is possible, or even using the van that spawns back here. What I've always done, though, is grab an ambulance and use it to get some decent height before making my throw. The trouble is, you get one chance with each car because if your grenade misses, well... But I was curious, could I actually just use the van? I wasn't taking any chances, so first I went to ammunition, bought a shitload of grenades, and then came back to give it a shot. Oh, first try! I am amazing! Oh fuck, I forgot that he starts to run away after that! So yeah, he makes a getaway, but luckily he can't actually get away, so you just gotta not die and find a vehicle to chase him down. He ended up putting on quite a show, but his car ultimately was set on fire and fell into the waters around Liberty City that are so polluted that people instantly drown in it. He is definitely 100% dead. Now, at this point, I was going to try and do vigilante missions on Staunton Island, but I wanted to do them with a tank. So I spent an absurd amount of time trying once again to get six stars, but had no luck and eventually remembered that one of Ray's missions unlocks Phil Cassidy, which means access to the M4 shotgun and rocket launcher. So instead, I detoured back to Ray, and what do you know, that's exactly what mission was next, arms shortage. Now, this mission actually gives us our first 3D universe appearance of Mr. Phil Cassidy, who in this game is, by all given information, an actual military vet who fought in Nicaragua alongside Ray Machowski, and subsequently lost an arm doing so. He now sells high-end weapons out of his compound in Rockford, but recently he's begun being harassed by the Colombians, looking to muscle in on his business. So Ray hires Claude to go and back Phil up. This is another of the game's harder missions, and I did know that going in, but it's also completely worth it. We gotta drive over to Phil's compound, and then we get about 15 seconds to try and prepare before the Colombian truck starts showing up. There's a rocket launcher on top of this crate, but if there's a way to get out there using Phil's truck or the surrounding geometry, I've never had enough time during this mission to find it, so instead I tried to stand my ground on the ground. It didn't end well. So, second time around, I decided to bring an ambulance and use it to get the rocket launcher, which did work, but I forgot about the guys who spawn inside the compound behind you, and it didn't end well. But third time's the charm, and fuck it, this time I'm just chucking grenades everywhere. Yeah, take that! How about a couple of these, and... Wait, where's... No, oh, for fuck's sake. Okay, fourth try. Grab ambulance, get rockets, blow up each truck as it arrives, kill guys in the back. Done. Whew. Now that's a tricky one, especially if you're incompetent like me. But thankfully, this means we finally have access to the game's power weapons. And since I had an absurd amount of money from vigilante and taxi and just regular missions, I spent an absolute crap ton on filling up all three, because the game was only going to get harder from here. And through Ray, we will now do a job by proxy for another new contact, although we won't get to meet him until after we've completed the mission. It's Donald Love, who is ironically the GTA Universe's version of Donald Trump, though do keep in mind, this would have been based on the image of Donald Trump in the early 2000s. This mission, Evidence Dash, involves collecting a series of incriminating photographs from a reporter by ramming into their vehicle, but while you watch me struggle to do so on screen, I want to discuss something about Donald Love. So, for those who don't know, since not many people have played it, in the originally PSP-exclusive title, GTA Liberty City Stories, Donald Love also makes an appearance, although with a different voice actor, and in that game, which takes place three years before this one, it is made more explicit that Donald Love is a cannibal. Now, some people, myself included, have wondered in the past exactly how they drew this conclusion from the simple line that Ray says at the beginning of the mission, but I think I see it now. So Ray says the reporter has photos of Donald at a morgue party, and that he has, shall we say, exotic tastes. Now, honestly, I don't think this is a stretch to assume that that's what they were implying in this game. I think Liberty City Stories maybe took it to a bit of an extreme, because they didn't have a ton to go off of Donald in this game, but I do think it makes sense. Anyways, 
In the actual mission, I pretty quickly lose my Karuma and have to use a cheetah to get the job done, but you only get a maximum of two stars while attacking the reporter's vehicle, unless you get out and otherwise go haywire. So it isn't that difficult to ram him six times, grab all six packages, and all the game wants you to do at that point is torch the car, and, well, the cops had already done that for me. Our next Ray mission is Gone Fishing, where we have to take out Ray's current partner. McCaffrey was his last one, but apparently he doesn't have the greatest luck with partners. This guy likes to do a lot of redneck fishing in the waters around Portland's lighthouse, throwing grenades into the water to kill the fish and then collecting them, so we'll use that as an opportunity to get a drop on him. Now, the only real way to get this mission done early is to use a police boat since it has guns. You find the guy doing his thing and he starts to run away, but he will very, very slowly start to drop barrels into the water, which will explode on impact. So you gotta chase him for a while and blow up his boat. I can't remember if I've ever actually blown up his boat using the police boat's guns, since they're pretty crappy. But eventually, he just drives his boat onto the land and tries to make a run for it, making it much easier to take him out. So, remember Leon McCaffrey? Well, apparently, he survived having his car lit on fire and being dumped into the river, and he is now being transported across town in an ambulance. And Ray wants us to finish the job that we started. I find it funny that this doesn't actually get Ray killed in the end, since the only other instance of Claude apparently screwing up a job definitely seems to upset him to some extent, but we'll get to that. For now, we have to go and find Leon being moved from the hospital in Rockford and first attack his ambulance. Once we do, his body cast falls out of the ambulance, but it's apparently the most powerful body cast in the history of mankind, because in order to break it and finally kill him, it takes multiple explosions. I try using my rocket launcher, but my wonderful controller issue arises once again, getting me killed, so second time around, I try to just blow up his ambulance, and I forgot that when you do, it just spawns a new one saying that it was a decoy, until you finally ram one of them and get his body to fall out. Eventually though, after six direct hits with a rocket launcher, he dies. Jesus. And that's all the Ray missions that we can do for now, but there will be one more later on. Time to head back to Asuka for a very easy mission, which also pokes fun at a competing series to Grand Theft Auto at the time, Driver. In this mission, we have to kill an undercover cop who has been giving the Yakuza trouble, and it's heavily implied that it is literally supposed to be John Tanner from the Driver games, as he is, quote, useless outside of his car. We go and find him at Kenji's Casino, and there could be a whole car chase here, but I mean, I have rockets, so... Since I was here, I also decided to now finally do Kanbu Bust Out again, this time taking the SWAT truck, but using a wanted bribe and Aspatria, plus the two wanted star bribes that I have at my safe house thanks to doing 20 vigilante missions on Portland, to lose the cops instantly. Then I just gotta drop the Yakuza guy off at his dojo, and mission complete. Since I knew it would come in handy, I also decided at this point to finally do my 20 vigilante missions on Staunton Island without my tank, but it's really not that bad. In later games, the vigilante missions get increasingly difficult and require more and more firepower, but in this game it's pretty much always one driver that you have to take out, and the challenge comes from not getting too much police attention of your own while you do it. But now it's time for the mission, uh, Grand Theft Auto, in which we, we, we steal some cars. So Kenji has a wealthy friend whose weakness is nice cars, and he wants us to help him repay a debt that he owes to this friend by acquiring several cars around the city, by whatever means necessary. Now, unfortunately or not, I guess, depending on your preference, this mission does not simply ask you to get your hands on the vehicle models asked for and deliver them, but instead to collect three specific cars from three specific areas and deliver those. This is significantly less interesting in my book, but it also means it doesn't waste as much of my time, so I guess it depends on what you want out of a game like this more. The next Kenji mission is another simple but fun one, Deal Steal. This mission establishes more of the rivalry between the Yakuza and the cartel, as well as continues a theme of constant betrayal between the gangs. This time, Kenji wants us to false flag attack the cartel while posing as the Yardies, so we have to get our hands on a Yardie car, which is one of my favorite cars in this game actually, and then go pick up a Yakuza contact. Then, we just gotta crash the deal between the cartel and Yardies taking place at a hospital in Rockford, and kill everybody involved, but I don't remember if it actually matters if you stay in the car to maintain your cover, like will happen with another mission coming relatively soon. Once they're all dead, grab the briefcase, and bring it back to Kenji for payment. Another Kenji mission, Shima. This time, he's basically got us doing grunt work. We have to make a collection run, and the first two go just fine, but on the third, the guy tells us he can't pay because some gang robbed him, and yells at Claude for not even being a Yakuza. So, Claude's gonna take the initiative to track down the gang, somehow, even though he didn't tell us anything, and as it turns out, it was the Diablos of Hepburn Heights. So, a quick trip over to Portland, and there's a bunch of Diablos waiting in the courtyard in front of Misty's apartment. 
Well, I still have my sniper rifle, so I made short work of them, and then hauled the cash back to Kenji. And now there's only one more job to do for him. You. How fitting you should choose this moment to sow your worthless faith. It would appear your attempts to dissuade the Jamaicans from becoming bedfellows with the cartel were wholly inadequate. Yardy pushes line Liberty Street, selling packets of spank like they were selling hot dogs. Those cartel pigs are laughing at us, at me. I will give you one last chance to prove my sister's faith in you to be well-founded. Run these scumbags into the ground and wash your shame in rivers of our enemy's blood! So as it turns out, even after framing the Yardies for attacking the cartel, they were still able to work out their differences and sort out an alliance. This is something we already know having done the King Courtney missions. Well, Kenji blames Claude for this and is quite visibly upset. And Claude, for one of the only times in the whole game, is ever so briefly taken aback. It's this scene that I was referring to earlier during that Ray mission, but then again, even if it isn't logical, somehow Claude did fail to kill Leon, so perhaps he was less offended by Ray's condemnation of that failure. Here, the Yardies and Cartel still forming an alliance has literally nothing to do with Claude, so Kenji's anger is more misplaced. For the actual mission, we have to take out a total of eight Yardie dealers around Staunton Island before they finish up their drug routes for the day. So there is technically a strict time limit to this, but it honestly feels more like random chance unless you already know when each of the dealers will disappear. It isn't too difficult though, just have a fast enough car and don't dawdle too much and taking out aid is a piece of cake. Claude, however, is officially done working for Kenji. But now it's finally time to work for the Dawn. Now, this is one of the mission threads that can cut you off from others if you do it too early, and it was unlocked after the Ray mission evidence dash, but I always save it for last. This is also one of the most intriguing and mysterious mission threads in the entire GTA series in my opinion, with all of Donald's missions being focused around the character who arguably was the reason any of this game happened at all, the Oriental Gentleman. Yeah, remember back in the intro? The cartel were actually breaking this guy out of prison, not Claude or 8-Ball. They all just happened to be in the same transport. It was then that the cartel captured the Oriental Gentleman, and they've been keeping him in custody ever since, but it's never made explicitly clear why they want him why Donald likes him, or what his role is in any of this, and that is I think what makes this whole thread so fascinating. Not every mystery needs to be answered. Often the best ones are the ones that keep us thinking long after we've experienced them. In this mission, Donald hires Claude to break the Oriental Gentleman out of the cartel's custody at their compound in Aspatria. So first, we have to get our hands on a cartel cruiser gang car, which patrols around Aspatria, Rockford, and Fort Staunton, and then once we have one, use it to gain access to the compound. Now, all you need to do is touch the gate with the truck and it will open, which is good because the cruiser I got my hands on already had its wheels popped. Once inside, the smartest play is always to just keep your distance and take out each cartel guy from as far away as you can. Most of them only have AK-47s, not M4s, which is good, but still, it pays to be careful in this one. Once everybody in the center compound is dead, you have to locate the Oriental Gentleman, but just be prepared. Each time you open one of the garages, including his, there are more guards. Lucky for me, I found him on the second try though, and then it's a simple matter of getting him into a car and getting the hell out of there. Time for a big one. This is the one that can lock you out of a number of other missions and therefore 100% completion if done too early. Waka Gashira Wipeout. Donald Love gives us a speech about his Machiavellian plans. He wants to instigate a war between the cartel and Yakuza, much like the Yakuza tried to do between the cartel and the Yardies, but on a much larger scale. To accomplish this, he hires us to assassinate our former boss, Kenji, and do so while disguised as the cartel. Now, there's no hard evidence to support this, but I believe that Claude takes this job with glee because of his being offended at Kenji's earlier outrage. Now, it's possible it's all just convenient, and Claude couldn't give less of a crap since none of this was his idea, but I still think that his reaction that he has in SmackDown is proof enough that he was not only willing to kill Kenji, but happy to do so. So, similar to the last mission, we have to steal a cartel cruiser and then go find Kenji having a meeting on top of the car park in Newport. Now we have to kill Kenji and all of his guards without ever getting out of the cruiser, which means our only option is to keep our distance and use drive-bys to slowly and methodically deal with the Yakuza. Actually hitting Kenji is always a bit annoying because you don't want to get too close and be set on fire or lose too many tires, but he's surrounded by vehicles, so blowing them up usually takes care of him. Once he's dead, all we gotta do is leave the borders of the Newport district and boom. That's another former mission contact dead at our hands. Any missions for Kenji you hadn't completed before this would then be lost, which is why it's best to save this mission until at least after you've done all of his. Alright, things are gonna keep ramping up. Donald's missions are among the game's hardest, which is appropriate, and the next one can be a real bitch. A drop in the ocean. 
So, Donald wants us to now collect some mysterious packages being dropped by airplane into the waters between Staunton and Portland Islands. We have to get our hands on a boat and then wait for the plane to fly over as we collect the packages, and as we do, our wanted level will keep increasing, stopping just shy of the full six stars at five. Now all that's left is to get the packages back to Donald alive, but in GTA 3, with five stars, that is not as easy as it might seem. This was honestly one of the craziest runs of this mission I've ever done, so I want to play for y'all a quick little clip. Okay, I made it to land. Oh my god, run, run, run! This is such a shit show. Oh my god! Just need a car, please. Oh god! How am I still alive? Yes! No! Yes! Okay, okay, this is good, this is good. No, 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 this is bad. Okay, it's fine. It's a slow-ass van. We're not far, it's fine, it's fine. Oh god, oh god, oh god, oh god, oh god, please. Yes! Oh. This game can be so intense, but when you actually pull it off by the seat of your pants, man, that is a good feeling. But before continuing more Donald's missions, I saw that Ray's last mission was now available, and I knew exactly which one it was, so I beelined it for Belleville Park. This one, Marked Man, sees us having to personally drive Ray to the airport to escape his various illegal entanglements, and it becomes available after a drop in the ocean when the third and final landmass, Shoreside Vale, is finally unlocked. Now, unlike Portland and Staunton Islands, Shoreside Vale will not see nearly as much time and only has about six missions total that are started from there five of them being the landmass's gang missions. The main features of Shoreside Vale are the huge dam, implied connections to a larger Liberty state, and most prominently, the enormous Francis International Airport, which takes up an absurd amount of the map. So this mission is a pretty simple catch, but it can be a bit tricky. The only goal is to get Ray to the airport, but the FBI has the bridge that leads to Shoreside Vale blocked, and are also monitoring the exits to the tunnels. What I didn't realize was that even driving on the road underneath the Shoreside Vale Bridge can get the FBI to shoot at you, which they did, popping my tires before we even got started, sabotaging my first attempt. But, during my second attempt, I simply took the tunnels in a fast car and booked it out of the exit, knowing there would be at least a couple dudes on top of the tunnel exits waiting to try and take us out. Really, it's just a matter of getting lucky with your positioning based on the traffic, because once you get past that one snag, you just drop right off of the airport and you're good. Almost. See, Ray leaves and gives Claude a key to a secret lockup on Staunton with some weapons and a special vehicle, and we can't actually finish the mission until we get it, but the FBI are still present on the bridge. So we have to make another mad dash through the tunnel and back to Staunton Island, and now we get one of the game's best rewards, a bulletproof Patriot. I always take this and immediately save it at my garage since there's only one in the game, but be careful. You have to be strategic about when you use it since early GTA games just love to despawn cars that you bring onto missions. Now it was time to do something that I've been trying to do for a long time. With the third and final island unlocked, it also means that six stars are finally obtainable, and that means tank time. So I finally came up with a strategy that I thought would work. You enter the car park in Newport, which when you enter it, changes the loading zone to one where the traffic doesn't spawn. Go up to the top and park a car in this corner, which lets you get on top of the car park outer walls. Then you just walk to the corner, and right on the actual corner, you will re-enter the exterior loading zone, allowing cars to start spawning again on the streets below. Then it's simply a matter of going ham. Now, it took me a while, and I spent several minutes just bunkered inside the car garages, waiting for the perfect opportunity to grab a tank, but the thing is, tanks, like all emergency vehicles, will be locked until the driver gets out, and they won't get out unless both of you are still enough that they feel like they have enough time to get out and shoot you. The other thing, though, is that soldiers carry M4s, which can literally kill you that quickly, even at near full health. Eventually, though, on my third try, I got it. Oh, suckers, I got you now. And then I immediately made room in the only garage which can fit it so that I would always have it in the future just in case, because you never know when you're going to need a tank. Now, if you'll recall, I wanted the tank because I wanted to do vigilante missions. Originally, it was for Staunton Island, but now I'd been thinking for Shoreside Vale, but apparently, I forgot how horrible of an idea that was. Vigilante in GTA 3 especially requires you to be quick, and the tank is anything but quick. On top of that, the layout of Shoreside Vale is among the most frustrating to navigate 3D landscapes in the entire GTA series. So combining these two things makes for a very, very miserable attempt at Vigilante. Eventually, I just gave up and headed into the next Donald Love mission, and at this point, we are nearing the end of the game, so strap in for some rage and frustration. 
Now for probably the game's most significant and certainly one of its longest main missions, Grand Theft Arrow. So during the mission a drop in the ocean, the packages that we collected were actually a decoy, and the real package was on board the plane all along, which has been sitting at a hangar in Francis International Airport. Well, the authorities started sniffing around, and Donald wants us to go and secure it before anyone else gets their hands on it, so off we go. Upon arriving at the hangar, though, we find the cartel has already beaten us to the punch, attacking the FBI and apparently stealing Donald's package, meaning that it's up to us to track it down. Now, I know how this mission goes, obviously, but I let my curiosity get the better of me when I decided to blow up the van outside the hangar just to see what happens. Well, as it happens, it fails the mission, which makes sense. See, what you're supposed to do is take out all the Colombians, which I always use Ray's Bulletproof Patriot to do, and then investigate where Claude notices the van reading Panlantic Construction and heads to the Panlantic construction site in Fort Staunton. This begins the second act of the mission. Now, doing this mission without Ray's Bulletproof Patriot is certainly possible, especially with heavy use of a sniper, but it can be absolutely brutal, so I never risk it. The Colombians here still mostly only have AK-47s, but they are so tightly packed and GTA 3's gunplay can be so stiff that it just isn't worth the hassle of having to redo everything. Once everybody is finally dead, we have to ride the elevator to a higher floor of the construction site where we finally get to see our main antagonist make a physical return. I actually go out of my way to return my Patriot to my garage before actually finishing the mission though since I was terrified of the game despawning it. Hey, let's get this out of here. God knows what it is, but he seems to want it badly enough, so it must be worth something. Who the hell? You! Hey, take it easy, amigo. No es nada, no es nada. I left you pouring our heart out into that gutter. Hey, don't shoot, amigo. No, no, no problem. We all friends. Here, don't be such take a this. pussy. Hey, we got no choice, baby. You always got a choice, you dumb bastard. I'm sorry about the crazy bitch, man. They, they all the same, please. Por favor. So, the whore got away. But you've done me a favor. You're not the only one that has a score to settle with the cartel. This worm killed my brother. I never killed no Yakuza! Liar! We all saw the cartel assassin. We are going to hunt down and kill all you Colombian dogs. I'll be operating on our friend here to extract information uh, and uh. a little pleasure. You, drop by later. I'm sure I'll require your services. Please, amigo! Uh, don't leave me here with her, man. She's she's psycho, chico, man. Please, amigo. Hey, hey, amigo, amigo. Ah! After that, the mission isn't actually done, though, since we still have to return the package to Donald. But for now, we are officially in the final stretch. Just a string of gang missions and a handful of main ones before we can wrap things up. As I said, Shoreside Vale doesn't get much attention in this game. Just a couple more Donald missions. Next up is escort service. Great. An escort mission. In this one, we have to guide the Oriental gentleman in a secure car as he makes his way to a lockup in Pike Creek. But actually, I remember this mission being a lot harder. There are a number of cartel cars that will try to attack you, but the real danger are the Colombians standing on various corners with assault rifles. I feel like I've struggled with this mission a lot in the past, but in this particular run, I actually got really lucky and managed to get the truck all the way to its destination using a cab that had its tires popped basically the entire time. Nice. Then, to follow up, we have to, annoyingly, drive all the way back to Staunton Island to start another Donald mission, which literally asks us to drive right back to where we were. This time, we have to act as a decoy, driving a secure car just like the Oriental Gentleman in the last mission, and lead the cops away for the full duration of the timer, without ever having our truck be destroyed. Obviously. The thing I usually do to make this mission easier is just drive to the airport, since there's so much room to maneuver. And after a short two and a half minute pursuit, bam. That's all the Donald Love missions. Sort of. Alright, time for our only mission threat on Shoreside Vale with the gang missions for D-Ice of the Purple Nines, or Red Jacks gang, based out of Wichita Gardens. Now, D-Ice's missions are all pretty difficult, more than most, but I always like to get them over with since oftentimes they annoy me, at least one of them does. This first one is actually pretty good, Uzi Money, though points subtracted Rockstar for using a Uzi instead of Easy joke twice in one game. All we gotta do is drive by on at least 20 Red Jacks, the rival gang to the Purple Nines, but D-Ice also says that the Purple Nines will shoot at us too while we're doing it, and they won't count towards the 20. This mission is basically just another rampage, but it's also the only one done in a vehicle, so I kinda like it. What's next? 
Well, this is the mission that first introduces the concept of the RC car in the 3D era of GTA, Toyminator. In this one, we have to take control of an RC car and chase down four Red Jack vans, crashing into their tires to trigger the RC car's explosives. That's it, though. There's nothing terribly complicated, and nobody tries to shoot at you or stop you. On to the next one, but... <sighs> Alright, so this is definitely a contender for my least favorite mission in the game, Rig to Blow. Now, this mission is very simple in concept, but what it asks you to do is just annoying. You have to drive D-Ice's Infernus, which has been fitted with a bomb, all the way to Portland, though strangely not to 8-Ball, and have the bomb removed, then bring it back to him. This means driving all the way to Portland without hitting anything, basically, although it has more to do with how hard or fast you hit something, it seems like, since you can lightly graze some objects without instantly blowing up. I died so many times trying this. Granted, I am very stubborn and impatient, and eventually realized the timer was plenty generous enough to allow me to drive a bit more careful, but damn this mission drives me nuts. The best method that I've found is to just use the Porter Tunnel and take your time, but once you finally get the bomb removed, you're also expected to return it in mint condition. This means being extra careful past Staunton Islands, since there's nothing on Shoreside Vale. No ammunition, no pay and spray, nothing, so I still gotta try and be careful. Thankfully, the timer stops once you get the bomb removed, though, so thank god. Unfortunately, the next de-ice mission is also pretty frustrating, Bullion Run. In this one, a bunch of gold has been spilt on the road where you enter Pike Creek, and de-ice wants us to collect as much of it as possible and bring it back to his lockup, with 30 pieces total required for completion. The catch is that each piece of gold you collect makes your car exponentially heavier, but thankfully the warehouse is basically right around the corner. Unfortunately, I didn't realize that at first and instead drove away only to screw myself over. I failed this one a few times, but I feel like most of it was on me this time since I just wasn't paying attention, but eventually, I settled on getting it done the old-fashioned way, using a goddamn tank. But now it's time for the final de-ice mission, and it's actually a pretty neat one conceptually. To finally put the rivalry between the Purple Nines and Red Jacks to rest, de-ice is calling for an all-out rumble in the mission, uh, rumble. We have to take Deice's brother with us, since Deice is still in prison apparently, and drive down to a little picnic area that's never used for anything else. Then it's the two of us against nine members of the... wait, the, pur the Purple Nines? Shit, I think I've been mislabeling the gangs this whole time, but it's actually just kind of funny since it speaks to the part of the joke that they were making in this mission, with them basically being interchangeable. I actually managed to kill all nine of the Nines, with help from Deice's brother, and keep his brother alive. But, you know, everybody's gotta go sometime. Alright, here we go. Final stretch, beginning with the mission Bait, given by Asuka, but now from the construction site in Fort Staunton, which the Yakuza have taken control of. While Asuka tortures Miguel, she makes it clear that she is now on a warpath that aligns with Claude's own interests, that being to find and kill Catalina. By now, Catalina is so sick of Claude still being alive that she dispatches several hit squads exclusively in Shoreside Vale for some reason to hunt down and kill us. Asuka sees this as an opportunity, and tells us to lure each of the death squads to a Yakuza ambush in Pike Creek instead. My first attempt, I actually screwed this up because I killed the attackers before the Yakuza could do enough damage, but in my defense, they looked like they were getting their asses kicked. I also made the mistake of only luring one with the intention of going back to get the other two afterwards, but I never made it that far. On the second attempt, I did the much more logical route of driving through Shoreside to trigger each of the pursuers, and then back to the Yakuza compound training my rifle on the gates as the Colombians approached, prepared to back up the Yakuza if necessary. Thankfully, the second time around, my help didn't seem nearly as needed, and eventually we took out all three death squads, without a single death of the Yakuza, actually. These last few missions, though, are all pretty hard. Next up is Espresso to Go, in which we learn that the cartel has been pushing Spank through a front company, the Cafe Copy House, and they have stalls set up across the entire city, selling it. So, Asuka wants us to torch all of them quickly, before the cartel has any time to react. So you are given a pretty tight time window here, and have to track down a total of 8 dealers, 5 on Staunton and 2 on Portland and Shoreside each. The thing is, the game doesn't initially tell you how many are on each island, until you've destroyed all of them, and also, I'm an idiot. My first time around, I for some reason forgot that there were stalls on Portland too, and screwed myself for time trying to rush back to the first island through the Porter Tunnel. My second time around, I forgot to plan my route properly and just restarted, but I got it on my third try, after driving all the way around the map to find the 8 dealers, since the timer doesn't actually start until you kill the first one. But with that one taken care of, it was time for the hardest mission in the entire game. For me, anyways. S.A.M. So, in this mission, we are tasked with shooting down a plane coming in full of Colombian spank, 
and then collecting it all to stash for presumably sale by the Yakuza later. Now, granted, a lot of the difficulty I ended up having with this mission was down to my pig-headed habit of trying to outsmart GTA 3, but pretty much any way you slice it, this is a very tricky mission. The first thing you have to do is grab a boat and reach a buoy near the airport, and shortly afterwards the plane will start its landing run, but for me, even getting to that point was a struggle. See, I was thinking that I should grab a fast boat, or a police boat, and drive all the way around Staunton Island, but I forgot that on both the north and south ends of the island are giant pipes which try to block the player from crossing. Thankfully, I was able to clip through them, on both ends actually, but I would end up wasting so much time even getting there that as you'll see shortly, it was all for nothing. So then I would try to shoot down the plane, and never had any issue with that, but as soon as you do, you get four stars and police helis will start shooting at you, and your boat. I thought several times I would be fast enough to reach the shore after collecting all the packages, only for my boat to catch fire and leave me stranded in the middle of the water since I would usually survive the initial explosion. Eventually, my stubborn ass started reading the actual mission text and looking at the map to reach the boat the game wants you to use, but this is an even slower boat and just seemed to get me killed even quicker. What finally worked for me was putting my bulletproof patriot at the end of the dock, getting really lucky and grabbing all the packages quick enough, and then making a mad dash for Staunton Island but it took me an absurd number of tries. Once again, a lot of these fails were due to my own hubris, but it's still rather obtuse game design, but this was 22 years ago. When I finally get back to the construction site alive though, I forgot to keep my Patriot safe. So the price for finally finishing this mission after like an hour of attempts was the loss of my best vehicle, which would have been invaluable going into the final mission. But it's time. Bulletproof Patriot or not, when we finally finish SAM, we find Miguel and Asuka both dead at the construction site, and a ransom note pinned to their bodies, written by Catalina. She demands Claude bring $250,000 to the cartel's villa in Shortside Vale in exchange for Maria, and since I already have the money, it was time to finish this. Honestly, I don't think I could have used the Bulletproof Patriot in this mission anyway, so whatever. Let's just do this thing. Whether because he actually cared about Maria or just wanted revenge on Catalina that badly, Claude brings the money to the villa and willingly hands it over in exchange for her, but Catalina is unsurprisingly not a woman of her word, and I think Claude knew that. She kidnaps Maria for some reason, and runs off into a helicopter, and then we have to fight our way to her with all of our weapons removed. The real question is, did you turn up to rescue Maria or to get me back? Well, I got news for you. Shooting you will be a pleasure, but dating you was only business. You are muy pequeñito, amigo. Throw over the cash, and you can have this overused puta back. You have been a busy boy, but you haven't learned. I'm not to be trusted. Kill the idiot! So, slowly and methodically, but not too slowly and methodically, I take out each Colombian and then make a quick stop at my apartment in Wichita Gardens, which I haven't really mentioned yet, to get some extra ammo. Then start making my way towards where I know she is, the Cochrane Dam. Now, finally, almost all of the Colombians in this mission will be carrying M4s, and will therefore cut you down almost instantly. And since I don't have access to all my weapons anymore, it's necessary to be smart about your approach here. Tried to listen for which Colombians had M4s and prioritize them, and keep my distance as much as possible. Also, being sure to collect any M4s that dropped before they despawn since the ammo is super handy here. The last thing to watch out for on the initial run on the dam is the guy who gets into a truck at the end, and the dudes on top of the platform, but once you have Maria and grab the rocket launcher, you only get three shots to hit Catalina's heli. But despite my enormous trouble with the second to last mission on my first try, with no cheats and barely any help from my hidden package pickups, I got it done and it was really satisfying. Residents in Cedar Grove have been coming to terms with the emotional aftermath of a full-blown war that hit the area yesterday. Local resident Clive Denver described to police a single gunman that he saw fleeing the scene with a dark-haired woman. Oh, you know, we're gonna have such fun, because, you, know, you know, I love you. I, I really do, because you're such a big, strong man, and that's just what I need. Anyway, what was I saying? Oh, you know, I forget, but you know what it's like, don't you? The sound of explosions shook nearby homes as people ran for cover. Several citizens were injured in the panic as gunfire was exchanged between ground forces and a helicopter circling the dam. Yeah, we got a good view from down here in the gardens. When the copter finally got taken out, 
Better than the fireworks on the 4th of July. With the death toll already over 20, police are still finding bodies. There have been no official denials concerning rumors that the dead were members of the Colombian cartel and still no leads as to the cause of the massacre. I broke a nail and my hair is ruined. I mean, can you believe it? This one cost me $50. Well, that was GTA 3. Now, there is a lot more to this game if you're a completionist. Stunt jumps, other side missions like Firefighter, the rest of the hidden packages, plenty to find, but I'm not and never really have been a completionist, and this series has never been that type of review show. It's just meant to be me recounting my experience playing the game moment by moment, sprinkling in my musings as I go. There is one mission I technically missed, but I'll very quickly go over it. It's the last Marty mission back in Portland, Her Lover, which sees Marty sending Claude after a man who his wife had been cheating on him with, you know, before he turned her into dog food. There's really nothing to it gameplay-wise, but at the end, instead of Marty turning the guy into dog food, the guy pulls out a shotgun and guns Marty down, and if we want, we can then run him over for the shotgun, which you always should. Beyond that, I did every mission in this playthrough and a pretty healthy amount of side content. I always enjoy coming back to GTA 3. There's something about its simplicity and lack of any ludonarrative dissonance for the protagonist, Claude. In pretty much every GTA game after this, it is always at least a little bit jarring when characters who otherwise act like they live in a real, if exaggerated, version of our world go on rampages that would certainly get them locked up. But for some reason, in GTA 3, it all just works for me. Something about the presentation and the world's charm all just feels cohesive, and I have so much fun just playing like a maniac in this game and not feeling out of character. The controls are certainly the clunkiest of the series, at least the 3D era, and with my controller mod making snipers and rockets a pain to use, it only made it worse, but what's here overall is a lot of fun for me. I would not necessarily recommend coming back this far if you're curious but not wholly invested in older games though. If you started on GTA 5 or even 4 and have barely touched games from before 2007, you may want to give this one a pass because its gameplay in a lot of ways certainly hasn't aged all that well. Missions are often very difficult, there's no ability to restart, and failing a mission can often involve a 10 minute process before you're even ready to try again. Some missions have obtuse or unclear objectives, or others basically require multiple playthroughs in order to complete, but even though that sounds like a lot of negatives, I still love GTA 3. In fact, while I play through a lot of the series pretty regularly, GTA 3 is the one that seems to just keep getting better every time I come back to it. I've always wanted to finally experience the first two games and the expansion pack, but could never stomach the awful controls, and GTA 3 feels like it takes the best elements of the 2D era, chaos, side activities, a more arcadey feel, and appropriately brought it up to date with better graphics, voice acting, and a story that, while not incredibly deep, certainly leaves a lasting impression. Oh, and as for Claude and Maria in the game's final cutscene, I still believe that Claude shoots her, but that's just me. But that's Grand Theft Auto 3. A nostalgia snapshot of gaming at its peak in the early 2000s, but also a bit of a dated experience 20 years later. It reminds me of the appeal of the older Fallout titles, some of my favorite games. They are fantastic in their own right, but I don't really blame anybody who can't get into them because at their core, they are definitely starting to show their age, and so is GTA 3. But it's a great game, and if you are curious about where the series started, or at least where it made its first massive leap, then give it a try. The only problem is, it has become increasingly difficult to get your hands on this version, the original PC release, and even this is half broken without community mods to get it functional again on modern hardware. The way Rockstar expects you to experience this game, if you do at all, is through the awful Definitive Edition port, but, well, I will be getting to those very, very soon. So stay tuned, and if you haven't already, why not subscribe? It helps the channel a lot more than you might think, and if you want to make sure not to miss new uploads, also hit that bell icon and set it to all notifications. Anyway, I've been the Criminal Historian, and this has been another episode of The Game Vault. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Today's video is brought to you by my wonderful supporters on Patreon. If you want to support the channel, one of the best ways you can do it is by joining my Patreon and supporting those who support me. All patrons at all tiers receive access to all of the perks listed on screen for only $2 Canadian a month, which is less than $2 American a month. But for those extra generous few who decide to pledge at the executive producer level, you can also promote your own content. Or if you really want to see me cover a specific game for the Game Vault, you can use the new Walker Villain tier. If you'd prefer to just give a one-time donation, you can use the paypal.me link in the description down below.
Today's episode is sponsored in part by my executive producers, Ezra Hambrick, Mason Collin, Chuck K45, and Die Castinator. You can check out Ezra's YouTube channel, Scott Games 99 where they play games such as NHL and MLB, and story-based games like the Red Dead Redemption series, with plenty more story-based games to come. Mason Collins' podcast channel, Where About Everything, where they discuss, well, everything, from zombie apocalypses to game remasters and more. Chuck K45's channel, who's working on setting up a channel all about buying farm equipment, fixing it up, and starting a new farm from scratch, and Diecastinator's channel, where they examine, review, and discuss all things diecast, from the history of the hobby to rare models and much more, with new videos basically every day, in addition to buying, selling, and trading the diecast cars. All links in the description down below. Thank you so much to all of my patrons, and please consider signing up if you enjoy my content. Even if you can't support me financially, though, you can support the show by showing my executive producers some love. 